Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasant duty to introduce Kitsiri Gunavardhana, uh, today's uh, monthly lecture speaker, uh, to introduce him. Um, Kitsiri is uh, very familiar to conservation circles and uh, birders, as well as those who go to um, national parks. Um, he is he is a corporate person, but he spends much of his spare time either in Vilpattu or in some other area uh, of birding interest. He is a, a corporate lawyer by profession, but uh, what I have noticed about him is I have been to presentations uh, given by Kitsiri before this. Um, Though he's a lawyer, he has a scientist approach to presentations, and his papers are extremely scientific and uh, thoroughly academic. And there is a lot of uh, academic rigor in what he does. So I have no doubt that he's going to deliver a lecture that is uh, very interesting and has a depth of knowledge that uh, few people have about uh, Vilpatu National Park, which is his. Uh, I think his favorite place, probably his favorite place on earth, since uh, he spends uh, so much time there. It's quite amazing how much time he, he does spend there. Um, what I also want to tell you about Kitsiri is he is an author who has written many articles to local and international journals, uh, including he has done a pioneering study on the black eagle, the Indian black eagle, which uh, is uh, a native bird in Sri Lanka. It nests here. He's also uh, put out a booklet on the endemic birds of Sri Lanka uh, for the benefit of advanced level students. So he does uh, quite a bit of uh, biodiversity education. He's also a joint secretary of the Ceylon Bird Club, and as well as a joint editor of its monthly journal, the Ceylon Bird Club Notes. And those of you who are have been together with him in the bird club, know how professional he is. He, um, he continues his studies purely because of his passion and his uh, love for the wilds. And he has a particular interest in leopards, and particularly the leopards of Vilpattu, uh, and also the fauna and flora. Uh, having said that about uh, Kitsiri, I do want to also point out that Vilpattu is not without its problems. Uh, the WNPS, together with uh, sister organization EFL and another organization, have uh, taken uh, the GOSL uh, and the Wildlife Department to courts over an illegal road. This is what we call the Newmanar Road, and it is extremely destructive, though people use it on a daily basis. Uh, many people use it without realizing what damage it causes just being there, let alone when people, big buses, speed along it. Uh, the fact that it isn't tarred and um, part of a highway today, uh, part of a highway network today, is because of this uh, Supreme Court case, seventh year. So who knows where it's going to go. It's a very strong case. One would say it's an open and shut case, but in Sri Lanka it's gone into a seventh year. Um, also, there are other issues in, in the park. There is a church, a very small church, which has expanded rapidly over the last few years. I rather not mention the name. Those who know, know what this church is. And uh, with the annual feast, which is this month, uh, thousands, not hundreds, thousands of people come in uh, to the park using this new road. And they occupy a large area. And there is uh, fairly serious temporary destruction. And there is a permanent effect as well in an area that is frequented by elephants. So I just wanted to balance out as much as we love Vilpattu, and there are many great things about Vilpattu. It's uh, not, the picture is not altogether rosy. I'm sure Kitsri will mention a few things as well. Okay, uh, saying that, uh, I won't waste any more time. Please, Kitsiri, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, Rohan and Rukshan, for that those very kind words of introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, as <clears throat> Rukshan mentioned, Vilpattu is one of, the place, one of the places 
which is very close to my heart. I'm very passionate about doing the best that I can for Vilpattu. So I'm actually overwhelmed to see an audience of this nature being interested in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Vilpattu, one of our premier national parks. And also I'm thankful to WNPS. I'm indeed privileged to have been afforded the opportunity of uh, taking my mission of impressing upon the public at large the importance of preserving Vilpattu, considering the type of challenges that Vilpattu has to take on. <clears throat> Vilpattu, ladies and gentlemen, is a is a is a is a is a is a, is a place of uh, place of uh, legend, place of history, a place where if you're interested in being quite peaceful, observing nature, such are its uh, such are its qualities in terms of the experience that you can have. So during my presentation, what I intend doing, ladies and gentlemen, is to talk to you a little bit about the, the legend, the, the prehistoric uh, <clears throat> burial grounds and so on that Vilpattu is known for, talk to you about the advent of the Singhala race, some of the archaeological places of archaeological importance that are found inside this national park, then, of course, a little bit about the study of leopards that I conduct at the park, as well as the flora and fauna which are found in Vilpat II. Last but not least, as a matter of fact, I intend starting by introducing the type of problems that are faced by Vilpat II. Lindy Alves, ladies and gentlemen, Lindy Alves is a person that needs no introduction for those of us who are interested in wildlife. This is what he said about Vilpattu in his lovely book, National Parks of Ceylon, page 55, and I quote, The great appeal of this park, possessors, is centered in these spacious sand-rimmed basins of blue water, the green plains in <clears throat> the foreground, and the tall, dense forests surrounding them. An indescribable peace pervades the air. In saying so, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lindy Alves, who was the famed director of once world-famous zoological gardens in, in Sri Lanka, as well as director of wildlife conservation and an avid conservationist, he has captured the very sense of Vilpattu. If you happen to have been to Vilpattu, ladies and gentlemen, and if you have uh, knocked off the engine and parked at a place like Kurutupandi, which is seen here, it's an absolutely a peaceful experience. You're parked here early in the morning. You have this cool breeze flowing across. It's absolute still. There's absolute silence except for, of course, the birds. Then you suddenly hear the shrieking call of the grey langer. You hear the, the, the alarm calls of the deer. You might, if you're fortunate, see the apex predator of this country, leopard, walking out, passing the sand rim and drinking water. It's an exhilarating experience to say the least. And Vilpattu is one place, ladies and gentlemen, where you can probably watch animals without having to watch them through the windscreens and through the drivers and so on of hundreds of other vehicles. And I guess those of us who are interested in Yala and so on would know what I'm talking about. So a little bit about the about facts of Vilpattu, ladies and gentlemen. Vilpattu, was, Vilpattu is the, the oldest protected area in Sri Lanka, declared a sanctuary in 1905. It was declared a national park in 1938 along with Yala. It covers an area of 325,000 odd acres, a large area of land. Unfortunately, Vilpattu was closed in 1985 because of the conflict. It was opened in 2003, but nevertheless, two very tragic incidents. One in 2006 May, where a group of wildlife lovers, including the famed 
author of The Road from Elephant Pass, Mr. Nihal De Silva, lost his life due to a landmine that blew up his vehicle at a location called Kattarambu Vellu. Then the park was closed, but there was a courageous, one of the finest of wardens that we've had in this country, Vasanta Pushpananda. He was the warden at National at Vilpatu. He was killed in May 2007. He was brutally hacked and shot and hacked to death. He was killed. He was shot, and thereafter his body was apparently cut into pieces when they found it, along with some army personnel at Kokkari Villu. So the park has, has, has had its fair share of violence, ladies and gentlemen, not to mention after the Anuradhapura massacre, the famous Anuradhapura massacre, where at the, at the uh, uh, sacred uh, Sri Mahabodhya, so many of the devotees were killed. The LTT terrorists went past, went through Vilpattu, and on their way out, they shot and killed many of the staff that were manning this park and protecting the park as well. So after all this mayhem, thankful to our security forces, ladies and gentlemen, the park was opened again in 2010, and I sincerely hope the park will be kept open continuously since now. But then, even though uh, we speak with so much of fondness about Vilpattu, ladies and gentlemen, as Rukshan mentioned, this is the illegal road which goes through Vilpattu. Don't ask me how I got this image. I cannot divulge. This is, this is Mailavillu, that's Kudira Malay Point. This is the <clears throat> road that cuts across, so to speak, Vilpattu. It's an illegal road should have been closed a long time ago. There's also another road that, that was cut on the borders of Vilpatu as well. So that is also shown from the air. Vilpatu, ladies and gentlemen, this road, when you look at from below, it cuts across some of the best forested areas in the western parts of the national park. It's teeming with wildlife. This uh, road causes tremendous amount of destruction. It has, in a sense, for the scoundrels who want to rape Vilpattu, this is like an access road where they go in vehicles, get off, the, the, because there's no checking of the vehicles when they enter from Eluankulam. There's no checking of the vehicles when they leave at, uh, from, uh, at uh, Modragamaru on the other side. So there are a lot of instances where people go, in these, go through the park, get off, some go and engage in poaching, then they get into the vehicles thereafter, asking the vehicles to come back. There can be so many other types of illegalities that take place. What is visible, of course, are things like road kills. This, this, this kind of stuff, ladies and gentlemen, the, the road is littered with garbage, plastic bottles and so on. And of course, if you go in the morning, you see quite a few road kills as well. That's an Indian, Indian Niger. This is an Indian gerbil, as well as some quite uh, uh, interesting from a conservation point. But it's so sad for this land iguana. This guy has been run over by a vehicle. You can see that it cannot go. It's dra it was dragging itself. The Radhi Mongoose is trying to see whether he can make a meal of it. But the, like Vilpattu, in a sense, the iguana is trying its level best to be resilient and uh, to ward off the threats that it's going to have. So when you cut a road through a pristine jungle, which is considered your oldest and the largest and one of the most beautiful national parks, one has to understand the type of damage that you're causing. One has to understand that Vilpattu is not a, a, a place of convenience. It's a place that has to be salvaged and protected in its own right. You will probably be a little bit more knowledgeable than, uh, than perhaps now at the end of my presentation, I will impress upon you the importance of preserving this, this area of land, not only because of wildlife, it's also because of so many other reasons. Then again, ladies and gentlemen, 
is a Google map that I managed to get thanks to Mr. Manju Gunwadhan of Slintech. This is in 2006. The place here is Marichakadi. You can see there is no destruction to this is the Marichakadi uh, Forest Reserve. But then we see in 2012, by 2011 rather, how the clearing started. This is this whole issue. Wilpatu has been attracting a lot of attention for wrong reasons in the sense, in terms of illegal settlements. Uh, initially, because of the fact that they were close to and they were some were encroaching upon the, uh, no, the, 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 the northern sanctuary of Wilpatu. And I will also tell you as to why, even though these are outside the national park, what actually is the, is the concern as conservationists have. These are, ladies and gentlemen, houses that have been built. There are a large number of houses which are built just outside the borders of Vilpatu National Park. Each of these households have an area of about 20 to 30 perches. Now, you tell me, in the way, uh, 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 father of the nation, Mr. D.S. Sinanayaka, when he settled people like the parents of the current president of this country, they gave at least five acres. Five acres of land, ladies and gentlemen, was enough, it was thought at that time, to be able to earn a living, to do their agriculture, have animal husbandry, and so on and so forth. When you go and plant people in this sort of large volumes with 20, 30 purchases of land area being given, and where there's no possibility of going to, going to office or going to a garment factory to work, what do you think these guys do for a living? There are no option but to jump into the forest, jump into Vilpatu or the buffer zone uh, forest reserves and engage in what they refer to as business So you can imagine the amount of destruction that uh, unplanned uh, settlements can cause. So ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> The second phase of it, I'm happy that Rukshan mentioned, he gave me a prelude to mentioning, mentioning some of these issues. And I don't want to appear here as, as a person who is uh, opposed to any religion. And I want, to, I want to mention the fact that I'm not too keen on, 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 on mentioning anything about race or religion with regard to these settlements, whether this happens by Muslims or Buddhists or Catholics or whoever. When the national park does not belong to a particular race or a caste or religion or anything like that, ladies and gentlemen, it's a national asset. So whether it be in Yala, whether it is Situl Pahuva that is in Yala that is trying to grow themselves into a big metropolis, or whether it is the Palle Kandal Church which is trying to grow in stature amidst a locality which is teeming with wild elephants, either of them, ladies and gentlemen, is something that the religious leaders, whether it be Christians, whether it be Hindus, whether it be Buddhists. And as, as a nation, as people, we have, we have to seriously consider there is only such little amount of forest cover left in this country. Are we going to go inside those entities, our own, in those ecosystems and destroy them in the name of all the almighty uh, May it be the Lord, may it be the gods, may it be Lord Buddha, may it be whoever that you believe in, could be anyone. Are we going to do that? Are we going to spare these locations, these, these, these national treasures to continue without having too much of destruction? So all what I request with regard to Palle Kandal Church, ladies and gentlemen, is that please understand those devotees who are going there, the request that I have been continuously making for the devotees who, who go there, until these matters get resolved in a court of law, please try and appreciate and respect the fact that you're entering a national park. Please respect the fact that things like plastic and silly silly bags can cause the death of many wild animals. Understand that this is not a place of amusement. These are few places that we have left alone for those creatures that share this earth with us. So having these concerns in mind, ladies and gentlemen, as your president, the WNPS president, very aptly put it, it is far from a bed of roses for Vilpatu. So initially when the war was over and where this lovely place that I've heard so much about from people like Mr. 
uh, Mr. Tilo Hoffman from Dr. T.S.U. De Silva, who were avid birders, who were travelers, who had written so much about this mysterious and wonderful place called Vilpattu, which was not accessible to some of us for about almost 20 to 30 years. I was happy to, 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 to go and I was captivated by the beauty of Vilpattu, but at the same time, Report, reports started coming in of these land grabs and illegal roads and so on. So I thought, okay, fine, what can I do? Yes, of course, you can go to court. At the same time, something that I've known in my job, let me create public awareness. Let me try and create awareness as much as possible among people about the importance of this place and the importance of preserving this for generations to come. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thought I'm going to concentrate Vilpattu from 2011 onwards. I've hardly visited any other place. I thought all my visits to the wild, I'm going to go to Vilpattu. Over the years, I've gathered knowledge on identifying species uh, in the field. So I thought I'm going to uh, launch a website, which I have done. And I'm going to share the knowledge in terms of field notes, in terms of the animals that I see, the, the orchids that I see, the flora and fauna and wildflowers and so on and so forth, as well as certain localities of interest like archaeological sites and so on. And last but not least, the flagship species in Vilpatu. Everybody goes to Vilpatu to see leopards. So I thought I'll try and uh, launch a study and uh, where identification of leopards and then try and understand their behavior much greater. So. And I thought I'm going to do all this in the public domain so that people will be able to share and understand a little bit more than Vilpattu. And I'm pleased to say, ladies and gentlemen, now with the interactions that I have on my site with emails and so on, I see that lots of people are interested. This lecture itself, you're gathering here. I'm really sorry to see a lot of people standing, but nevertheless, it's an, it's an overwhelming uh, predicament, overwhelming positive predicament on Vilpattu, I hope. All of you who are gathered here, you are opinion leaders, you are holding whole positions of leadership in society. When it comes to matters of nature, conservation, you will speak up, you will have the courage and the will in your corporate office, in your boardroom to voice and say that, well, this is nothing serious. This is something very, very serious. You need to take cognizance of this. We cannot allow some of these places to disappear and it is our right to ensure that it is not so. So ladies and gentlemen, with that introduction, Vilpattu, let's talk about Vilpattu. Vilpattu is a national park with a lot of, lots of habitats. There are three major uh, ecosystems that you can uh, talk of, the, the, the forest and forest related uh, ecosystems, wetlands, coastal and marine. Vilpattu is a, is a place of dense forest. About 70% of Vilpattu is covered with dense forest. And uh, the dominant species like uh, Palu, Veera, Thammenna, and uh, trees like Timbiri. So these are the dominant species in, 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 uh, in Vilpattu. Then uh, Vilpattu also has, apart from the Villus, it ha also has uh, wetlands. This is uh, Nelumbila and uh, so many other areas of marshland like Mahaveva, like Periavillu and so on. It also has coastal habitats, ladies and gentlemen. This is Kollan Kanatta. I'll talk about Kollan Kanatta with regard to the urn burial sites where there is coastal habitat. A fact that some of, some of you might not know is that Vilpattu is also home to the largest tracts of mangrove forest in this country, from the Putlam Lagoon, ladies and gentlemen, up to about Vidatalathiu, past Mana, are the best tracts of uh, mangrove forest. And of course, you get them on the site, uh, Trinko as well. So I'm sure Dinal will remember these images. I'll talk about Dinal and what we did in Vilpatu later as well. So the, the mangrove forest, I'm not going to talk too much about mangrove forest. All of you, I'm sure, are aware of the importance of mangrove forest for, uh, from a conservation perspective, from breeding grounds of fish and shrimp and so on and so forth, and the whole ecosystem that revolves around uh, <clears throat> mangroves. So that's the type of 
ecosystems that are available. Let's then talk a little bit about the history of Wilpatu, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is, in a sense, a place where all it began. Okay? Prehistoric burial sites have been found not only at Pomparipu, many of you must have heard of Pomparipu, but these sites are available, ladies and gentlemen, are found. Pomparipu, Kollankanatha, Pukulama, Tekkama, and, Karam, and Karamakulama is also another locality. It's in 1923, a gentleman by the name of A.M. Hokart is the one who initially found out about this, uh, the graveyard, so to speak, of people who lived in, an, in, a, in, in, in times uh, more than 2,500 years ago. And uh, it is estimated about 20 odd of these uh, burial urns, the clay pots have been recovered and about, uh, they estimate about 8,000 are scattered around Pomparipu and the rest of the areas in Milpatu. So for a, for a graveyard of that nature to, 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 to be found, ladies and gentlemen, you can imagine that this particular area would have been quite active in terms of human civilization, in terms of they found in these pots, other than, of course, human remains, they found things like metal jewelry. They were quite happy, ladies and gentlemen, the discussions that I've had with the National Museum, where very kindly they spent time explaining to me about uh, the fact that in these urns, this is one of the urns that, are, that is found that was unearthed at Pomparipu. It is now at the, uh, the, 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 the National Museum, ladies and gentlemen. So in these urns, apart from the bones, they found things like jewelry, things like uh, stone tools, uh, tools and stuff like that. And uh, something which is not very interesting, but what also has been found is that it is believed that the, the, dead, the, 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 the dead body, they permitted the dead body to decompose, whether it was put out to the elements or whether it was kept in an enclosed area, I don't know. But thereafter, they collected the bones and they chucked those bones inside these urns and then did the burial. Okay, so, uh, but they had some special uh, interest in the head. So the head was, the, the skull was placed on what is referred to as black and red, uh, where the, the, the community of people who lived in this, uh, in, during this time, uh, in, during the early Iron Age, were able to turn out that particular type of clay, which was internally, which was black and externally it was red. It was considered something special by the archaeologists. And it was apparently placed on those plates and uh, deposited inside these urns. So ladies and gentlemen, you, 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 you begin to then realize that, okay, it is a place of importance for wildlife, but this is also a place of extreme importance when it consider when you when you think of our history in terms of even the early iron age even now ladies and gentlemen if you happen to go this is the photograph that i have taken at kollan kanatha a place called kollan kanatha the beach area that i showed you earlier you could see the 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 the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the the pieces of pottery which are found on the beach all these are, are, are remnants of what is left of a grand civilization that thrived at Kollan Kanath and Pomparipu and so on years gone by. We also have an interesting place, ladies and gentlemen, called Kudiramale Point. The, the Greeks called it Hipporus. In the word Greek, hip, hippo means horse. You've heard of the hippopotamus or the river horse. So it's like in, in that sense. And the Tamil word Kudiramale, the word Kudira means horse in Tamil. So it looks as if, and it's in recorded history, it is, it is mentioned that this mountain, for whatever the reason, was always associated with horses. Legend has it, ladies and gentlemen, that this area of Sri Lanka was governed by the Malabar kings and queens. And there was a Malabar queen, a beautiful woman apparently, it's, it's said, called Queen Ali Arasani. They traded, traded pearls for horses at Kudiramale Point. It is also believed that her palace that was built at Kudiramale Point 
was destroyed due to a tsunami or a cyclone and that lies buried beneath Kudiramale Point. So ladies and gentlemen, also R.L. Bro here, again a gentleman who needs no introduction, R.L. Bro here mentions that from the northwestern sea, the only mountain that can be seen is Kudiramale Point. So Kudiramale Point, if you visit now, looks like this ladies and gentlemen, there's a cliff of about 50 to 60 feet here and uh, it's a place of interest in terms of things like and it is believed that uh, Kudira Malay Point ladies and gentlemen had a statue of a horse with a horse rider and the horse was on its rear legs and what is left today is only a hoof of that statue there is also, ladies and gentlemen, a tomb which is believed to be that of a Moor priest, which is found at the, almost at the beach, close to the beach at Kudiramale Point. And if you are very observant, if you walk about Kudiramale, you will also see fossils, fossilized shells and so on that can be seen at this interesting locality. Of course, Kudiramale Point was not made famous because of Ali Sarani or horse trading. It is made famous because of a gentleman whom you and I all, according to legend, owe a lot to. <clears throat> okay? Prince Vijaya, ladies and gentlemen, it is believed that Prince Vijaya, son of Singha Bahu and Singha Sivali, was up to no good in India. So the wise old king decided it's best that he sends his Paxi son off with 700, 700 of his followers to another country. How good if the leaders of today did the same thing to their sons, isn't it? <laughs> hmm? so that's why I called him a wise old king, right? So ladies and gentlemen, he came with his followers. He was stunned by the beauty of this mountain that he saw. So he came here and he landed. And he, as he set foot on this lovely island, he, legend, legend has it that he set his hands on the beach and the hands turned red, so he called it Thamba Panni. Of course, the balance, I'm not the expert to talk about how he married Kueni. And then, after a while, unlike many of the Sri Lankan males, got tired of his queen and got another beautiful queen from India. So, these are all things in legend, ladies and gentlemen. But Prince Vijay is known to be the first king of Sri Lanka, who reigned from 543 BC to 505 BC and founded the Singhala race. This is a view of Kudiramale Point, ladies and gentlemen, from the sea. And uh, I'm sure he would have been captivated and been interested in the reddish color of this place. And even if you go there now, you could see this red earth even now. Okay? So whether Vijaya touched and looked and called it Tambapanya or otherwise is something that I'm not able to confirm to you, but that's our legend, that's the history, and that is what, uh, that, that is what it's all about. Okay? So, then we move on to uh, another loving couple, Sali and Asokamala. Bear with me, I'm sure you must be wondering, I, we came for a wildlife lecture and this guy is going on talking about archaeology. Sali and Asokamala, ladies and gentlemen, are, are well known in Sri Lankan history. Prince Salia was the son of the famed King Dutugamunu. They say he fell in love with a lady by the name of Asokamala from a low caste, was known as a Chandala woman. They say her beauty was so much that it rivaled a well-known beauty in Sri Lanka who was known as Unma the Chitra, the mother of King, Pan King Pandukabe. And they lived at a place called Galbendiniravia, which is close to Maradan Madhu, which is in Vilpattu National Park. This is what is left of Galbandin Iravia. This image, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very thankful to Mr. Lalit Seneviratna, who put me in touch with the family of a park, the warden who was in Vilpattu in 1952, between 1952 and 1956, Mr. Chiko Morit. His wife and his daughters live in Bandaravela. And this is why Chiko Marit wrote, 
in his notes along with this photo. Ruins in Vilpattu supposed to be where Salia Kama the Chandala woman lived. Okay, so you are not able to access that locality. They have not done uh, done up the road as yet, but so Vilpattu, ladies and gentlemen, apart from the prehistoric populations and Prince Vijay and so on, also is a is a locality of archaeological importance. Another place is Galge Vihare, a place which belongs to uh, 1 AD, a wonderful place, but it's not so wonderful if you actually, uh, if you're faint-hearted to visit this locality because you have to get off the vehicle and walk, uh, not a very long distance, but of course it's known for its sloth bear and elephants and so on. So if you happen, if you if you if you're going there, be a bit cautious. This is these are some images that I've taken at Galge Vihare. The uh, it, it, it's a it's a place full of caves, and there has been uh, things like the uh, the the, <coughs> the, the Malasana or uh, the granite stone. Uh, for formations on which form the, that they have made to offer flowers and so on are still available at Galge Vihare. Not to mention the drip ledgers. You can see the very prominent drip ledgers found at this locality, uh, <clears throat> which is referred to as Galge Vihare. Now, it is said that the people who lived in, who people who buried their, their dead in Pomparipu were from. Uh, close to from a place uh, close to Galge Vihare, there is the the typical tank and of course the temple, and there would have been obviously a large village. Ochapukalu is also another place of such uh, interest, ladies and gentlemen. It is considered the largest ancient monastery which is found within Vilpattu. Ochapukalu is a place that uh, again one has to uh, uh, leave your vehicle and then walk for some time to climb this rock. It's a place from where, where you could see, uh, one of the places that at least I have been to, where you could see for, for a long distance uh, uh, on top of where this stone inscription is found. And uh, something of interest, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with regard to uh, the, the, the Ochapukalu archeological site, the first, People who visited this site uh, recorded the, the existence of shrine rooms and Buddhist statues and so on. Thankfully, due to the treasure hunters who are very uh, active these days, such uh, items have been now destroyed. There's this very interesting uh, formation, ladies and gentlemen, with the drip ledge and so on at Ochapukalu. I was quite, when I visited here, I was quite interested in this prop that has been, that's there, it, it looked a bit out of place. Despite that, I, I mean, I noted the fact that it was quite out of place until I spoke and got some images from Mr. Chico Morit. This is the same place in 1952, and this is Chico, and uh, you can see this pillar standing there as well. And what he said in that note was of great importance. Rock cave Vilpattu, we often camped here and fearing that the rock would fall on us, we propped up a stone pillar. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, these are interesting things that you come across when you do a bit of research. So this, that rock, that pillar obviously had nothing to do with the ancient history of Uchapukalu. But nevertheless, what is of importance? I'm sure, Rukshan, when most of you will agree with me, how many times have we heard of a warden in Vilpatu now going and camping at Ochapukallu? And if you, if you remember what I read, we often camped here. So that is a kind of dedication and that is the kind of passion with which the wildlife rangers and wardens worked during a time gone by. And now, when there's great amount of pressures on these parks, ladies and gentlemen, it will be lovely if we can find some of these wardens in their bungalows during weekends. Okay? This, ladies and gentlemen, is another place called Kuwaini's Palace. Kuwaini's Palace, even though it is very popular as the place where Kuwaini lived, according to archaeologists, 
they are not able to subscribe to that view. They think it's a monastery. Kuwaini may have come and worshipped here or whatever. I don't know. It's close to Khalibillu. But what is left of uh, the place that they call Kuwaini's palace is these are these pillars. Then, of course, during my wanderings of this national park, ladies and gentlemen, by the way, I've, you're not able to just wander around Vilpattu unless you have research permits. I've, I've, been, I've taken permits to do studies with Mr. Mendis Vikramasinghe. I, I, I believe he's here today uh, on, on uh, herpetology and so on and so forth, and more recently on wild, wildflowers with uh, <clears throat> Dr. Gaston, uh, Dr. Magdan Jasuri, I'm sorry, I mispronounced his name. So when you walk, you come across places of interest like this. There's no history about, uh, this is a place close to Karambakulama. So there must be a, there must be history to this place. Vilpattu is full of places of this, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and that's, so basically, uh, 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 an area which is of relevance and importance when it comes to archaeological sites, when it, it's of relevance to the history of this whole nation, it's uh, relevance to our practices by our forefathers who gave birth to what is Sri Lanka now. So you tell me if it's not worthy of protection or not from a people uh, whose, whose uh, roots are intrinsically interwoven in, in certain parts of this national park. So that being, ladies and, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk a little bit about a subject which you might find a little bit more interesting and exciting. The study that I do at Vilpattu, um, I've, I've always uh, mentioned the fact, and even on my site, I, I very categorically mentioned that I dedicate the study that I do to Ravi. Ravi was a vibrant member of this society, ladies and gentlemen. And it is thanks to Ravi that I, it is with Ravi that I went to Vilpattu for the first time. Uh, Pushpananda, the warden, the former warden, he invited me in 2005 to deliver a lecture to his staff on uh, venomous snakes. And Ravi, myself and Dilrukshan, I still remember we went, we went to Leopard Den, we picked up Vasantha and we went into the park, did a round and then in the evening we had this presentation. None of those guys are among the living ladies and gentlemen. I'm the only one standing now from that trip. So uh, when I talk about uh, Vilpattu, Ravi always comes to my mind because it's with, who, with him that I went in. And I still remember driving into Borupan because those of us who are regulars to Vilpattu, from the park entrance up to Borupan Villa, you don't come, come across such a wide open space. And I still remember the beauty of Borupan Villa, the time that I went in there. So leopards, ladies and gentlemen, according to the uh, handbook of mammals, of mammals of the world, they recognize 24 uh, subspecies. The subspecies that is found here, the Panthera pardus cotia, is, is, is considered as a, as, a, as, a, as a subspecies that is endemic to, to the country. And it's considered in, endangered. And uh, even though it is the big cat with the widest geographical range in, in Sri Lanka. So the, the reason why I started studying about leopards, ladies and gentlemen, is because I actually did not know anything about leopards before I started this study. I was nowhere near uh, anybody like Ravi or Rukshan or the people who are very knowledgeable on leopards. Even today, ladies and gentlemen, all what I am able to talk to you are the things that I have observed and uh, analyzed keeping the, 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 doing the stif, stuff that I'm doing. So what I do, ladies and gentlemen, very simply put, is that you go into, say, Vilpattu, if you see a leopard, I try and photograph the leopard in all possible angles, because I know enough to know that leopards, leopards don't change their spots, right? So therefore, from every angle of a leopard, you can identify the, 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 the it's like a fingerprint. So if you have a photograph of a, of a leopard, and if you photograph uh, 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 the same leopard on a subsequent day with the modern technology of having a computer and being able to enlarge, it's a pretty easy thing to be able to identify whether it is this particular leopard or not. So I do that and I, uh, uh, with a GPS, I take the, the, the location of, of the leopard, then I uh, mark that on a Google map on, on, my, on my site. 
and of course any observations and any 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 narrative that i want to write about that observation is included in this site as well so when it comes to leopards ladies and gentlemen there are six standard photos that i would look for but then again the leopard whom i meet sometimes doesn't know that so they don't oblige all the time this is one guy who obliged this was a leopard that is known as y for people like Sadina and Rajiv and so on who are here. I think this is one of the, uh, it is almost like a family member. It is such a close buddy that you see when you go towards Thalavila and Panikavila. So you try and get a photo of, uh, of this guy because it's usually it's easy to identify the leopard because they would look at you and you, you always strive to get a photograph of an animal looking at you, eyes pointing towards you. So you take uh, that's one area of the leopard which is much which is easier to photograph there are those who also go on the on on, on basically based on the mustachial spots here but i will i will tell you the reason as to why i don't only employ such such a such sort of a methodology then you try and get the two sides of the face then you get the two flanks like this then of course you also get the tail so those are the the six standard uh, sides of a leopard that I try to photograph so that in let's say on a on a on a on a on a on a subsequent visit if I'm able to only photograph this guy the Nilum Villa male too if I photograph this guy and if I was only able to get its tail by comparing the spot pattern here with my subsequent photo I would be able to identify whether this is that same individual I photographed because the spot pattern on their bodies ladies and gentlemen are like a fingerprint then what do I do then I will uh, if you basically as I, I, I do this study I in the public domain and uh, what I do is all the leopards that I have so far seen and photographed there are 47 of them ladies and gentlemen I would have them on on a, on on my site under a link called leopards of Vilpatu. so if you go into that that site and if you click on a leopard like this guy i know a lady here named it cleopatra so if you go and click on cleopatra ladies and gentlemen the page opens for cleopatra or the 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 Kumbukwila female too the names that i give are quite boring but the names that are given by the ladies and other more sort of innovative gentlemen who visit the park are really interesting. So this guy, ladies and gentlemen, so what I do is that I, I, pro I provide here whatever the angles that I have been able to get. If you click on these, the, 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 <clears throat> the photo here will change to this particular photo so that any individual is able to compare their photos with the spot pattern of the leopard and identify. I also give a Google map and give the spots where I have been able to see this guy in order to give an understanding of its range and the distribution. Then I also give the notes each time that I see. So if you go to a leopard and if you scroll right down, you will see from the first date that I have seen the observations and its growth and so on and so forth. But what I'm more interested and what I'm actually proud of what I've achieved, ladies and gentlemen, is this. Over the years, ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've managed to get uh, people interested in leopards from the first time that I spoke. So now there are 49 of them who regularly contribute to the site that I'm, I'm doing. So, and, 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 and what is of great importance is that many of these people who are here, they're not the likes of you and I who are in Colombo. These are guys from Vilpatu, young men, safari drivers, and so on and so forth, right? If you go, for example, uh, Hemant Vimalasena, who has provided me with the most amount of photos, is a, a safari jeep driver. He's known as Vimale's son. Right? So for all these people, ladies and gentlemen, what I've done is, if you go and click, if you go and click on, let's say, any of these names, let's say Hemant Vimalasena, a page will open under his name, giving all the images that he has. So ladies and gentlemen, in a sense, what I've done is I've created a website which is not only mine. It is a website which belongs to all those young people around from the villages of Vilpatu, like Hunuvilagama, Vanamalgama, and so on and so forth. And those guys 
are quite thrilled with the fact that they are able to tell their foreigners and whoever the customers they want, look, these are my photos, they are on my site. But without their knowledge, ladies and gentlemen, they are also now very keen on trying to identify what is this leopard. So every, every two or three days at least, ladies and gentlemen, when I go home, even though I am not in Vilpatu, I have received images of leopards. And I, for my interest, I get to know the movements of leopards to a, to a great extent, even though I have not been there. And I supply them back with the type of information like, okay, this is this particular guy, this is this chap's son, this is this female, second litter, this one. Oh, it's very interesting that that guy is found there and that bus has been sort of created. So that is something, ladies and gentlemen, which I'm extremely happy to share with you and happy about because I'm sure many of you will agree that places like Vilpattu and Singharaja and Yala and so on will long live if the people living around those national parks will take a greater interest in those national parks. So these young boys, ladies and gentlemen, uh, people like Achintya, people like Isuru, people like Hemanta, people like Jagat, these are all people who take photographs and thanks for technology and cameras and so on, ladies and gentlemen, now they can acquire cameras and lenses and so on and so forth at much less a price than it used to be. So it's at hand for many people than it used to be earlier. And what I also do is I update on my site for each leopard all the sightings which gives the names of the people who have contributed by sending images. But if I don't see an image and if I'm not 100% sure of the particular identity, I will not include here. So therefore, all these people who contribute to, 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 to the, the, the leopards uh, study that I do, one thing that I would obviously require is the accurate location. So I've told them, tell me the location and if the exit information is not there in the photograph, the date and the time so that it will be of value to me as well. Then I'm sure you guys might ask me, okay, okay, fine, you have photographed 47 leopards, surely there are more leopards in Vilpatu, obviously, yes. What happens if somebody else photographs a leopard which you have not photographed? So there's a different section for that, leopards of Vilpatu, guess there are 23 of them, ladies and gentlemen, so far, and under their, under their names, each leopard is given here and their sightings are given there as well and if at all, if I'm able to photograph that leopard on a visit that I go, then it gets transferred to the main site. So ladies and gentlemen, that's a little bit of the study that I conduct. Leopards are charismatic creatures, ladies and gentlemen. This is a guy called Burupan Villa male. This leopard was not seen for the last three years. Perhaps it has moved to an area uh, it has made a kingdom of its own, like Vijaya. One hopes that it would come back. Uh, this is the area, Borupanvira, this is on is, and Valaswala, the area where this guy was born. So one hopes that he would probably come back one of these days, but three years we have not seen it. This is an image that I'm very happy to have been able to take, ladies and gentlemen. This is the, the Maradan Madua female and the two cubs, her first litter the proud mother with the two cubs and uh, this guy which is I, which i refer to as the maradam madu male too is the one that is regularly seen around maradam madu ikrigollava and so on there are many there are number of leopards around that area but this guy was also seen uh, around around <clears throat> around uh, maradam madu area leopards are also ladies and gentlemen quite uh, protective of their cubs and uh, this particular female, the Valasvala female with the two cubs, she was extremely protective in terms of uh, uh, not uh, 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 permitting uh, many people to photograph these guys. I think there are few occasions where she brought them out and then some of us managed to have some images uh, like this. But after, after these few uh, times that managed to get these images, ladies and gentlemen, Myself or the 49 other people who, who visit Vilpatu often, they've not seen them again. Perhaps they have moved into another area. I also know of this debate that ongoing in, in, in Vilpatu as well as other national parks about uh, making concrete cement ponds, which is an ISO. Yes, I agree it is an ISO, 
But you must also remember, ladies and gentlemen, in times like this where there is drought, believe it or not, even though there are floods in the south, there is drought in the north. And uh, it's a lifeline, not only to leopards, but so many other animals. I just want to put this photo so that you just, uh, understand uh, the importance of sometimes. Yes, these could have been built so that they blend much better with nature so that you couldn't see and so on and so forth. But all that being said, they serve the purpose for which they are built as well. A lot of the action these days, ladies and gentlemen, is around this female. The Kudapadas, the female one, she was seen on the 28th of last month with a tiny little cub. I'm sure some of you who are regulars to Vilpattu would have watched that video of her crossing the road with almost a mong mongoose size, about maybe one, one, one month, one and a half month cub trailing behind her. So if you happen to go to Vilpattu, check around Vil uh, Kokkari Villu, where that is her area of... This is Natta, the guy who's the absolute showman in Vilpattu, but now he's come of age, he's not seen around the parts that he was usually seen, now he has moved towards Kali Villu and so on. The reason why it's called Natta is you can see that its tail is comparatively shorter than the others. Leopards, ladies and gentlemen, like us, like human beings, have their own individual characteristics. Okay? Now this guy, as you can see, all these people are photographing. It is almost like a studio, right? Vehicles on this side, vehicles on that side. The leopard can easily move into the forest, but he wouldn't want to do that. He would want to just come and say, look, I'm the man. Photograph if you want. But all the leopards are not like that, ladies and gentlemen. So those of us who travel around Vilpattu, or any other national park for that matter, ladies and gentlemen, that's the reason as to why you're required to drive slow. Unfortunately for me, this, I've managed to photograph this leopard from the opposite side, as you can see. But these two vehicles, obviously they did not see the fact that there was a leopard lying here, came charging in, and one dash, and that, that's it and then the leopard was not seen the whole day. You would understand that there's a lot of uh, emotion that with which we talk about leopards. Oh, they are lovely, they are like kitty cats, and so on and so forth. But just in case to put things in perspective, ladies and gentlemen, you must also remember that not so long ago, in 1910, the man-eating leopard of Panar killed and devoured 400 human beings. In 1926, the famous man-eater of Rudraprayag is known to have killed 126 people. We fall short of this when it comes to leopards, unlike cricket. Our man-eater in Poonani, ladies and gentlemen, only managed to reduce the population by 12. Okay? So, please, so you must understand that uh, there are increasing number of instances I have seen in photographs in Yala, Thankfully, it doesn't happen still in Vilpattu. When there's a leopard sighting, you see people on the ground, people trying to walk, guides trying, walking all over the place as if it's a circus. So I think those people also should remember that you're dealing with a big cat. You're dealing with a big cat which is extremely powerful. Pound to pound, ladies and gentlemen, leopard is considered the most powerful big cat that we have. Okay? I know that you, uh, you think of the charismatic lions, the, 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 the largest cat, the tiger. Try telling a tiger to carry twice its prey, twice its weight and go up a tree. Okay? Just think of yourself carrying your wife's handbag and trying to climb a coconut tree. You'll, you will then understand what a powerful animal this is. I've seen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure Rukshan and all the wildlife uh, enthusiasts will agree with me the amount of sh sheer power these guys have I mean you and I are like chicken feed ladies and gentlemen if one of these guys want to just fling into our vehicles and do something which is not very pleasant so therefore give them their distance protect yourselves as well as permit the leopard to protect itself by keeping your distance don't try to be too smart for those of us who are having luxury camps and camping inside and so on, always remember you're dealing with an animal which is extremely cunning. They're not dumb like the sloth bears. They wouldn't just come charging at you. They'll hide behind, they'll ambush. And if you have seen the amount of strength that is needed 
for a leopard to restrain a samba, a massive animal, pin them to the ground and suffocate them with their bare paws and teeth. All what you had to do is go home and try to do that to your cat. You'll understand the type of power leopards are blessed with. Ladies and gentlemen, Vilpatu is not only about leopards. There are 31 species of mammals that are recorded in Vilpatu and 208 species of migrant birds. There are about 450 odd species of birds with 33 endemics, ladies and gentlemen. Most of the endemics are in, in the wet zone areas. These are samba that I mentioned. You can see that it's a quite a large animal. More often than not, like the poachers, leopards also go for samba. The, many of the kills that I've been able to photograph are over samba kills. There's also this talk about Vilpattu does not have elephants. There are lots of people who ask me, is there only one elephant in Vilpattu, the guy who's seen at Panikka Villa, is that the only elephant? It's not so, ladies and gentlemen. Vilpattu is a large, large, large uh, national park. There are certain areas of the, the park that are f where elephants are found during the dry months in September, August and so on. This is at Panikka Villa. I'll just go through quickly so that you'll understand the, the, the amount of elephants which are also found. This is at Periyavillu, which, can, which is on the old Mana road. Rukshan mentioned it's full of elephants. You can see large herds of elephants are seen uh, at, at uh, Periyavillu. Again at Panikka Villa, a herd that came to drink once we were in the bungalow. Vilpattu is also a place where you can see a number of tuskers. Not only one elephant, ladies and gentlemen. This is Pomparippu Tusker 1. These are names that I have given, not that these guys will respond when you call them like this. <laughs> just for my purposes of record. This is Pomparippu Tusker 2. And this is Palle Kandal Tusker. Ladies and gentlemen, all these three guys that I mentioned, I said Palle Kandal and Pomparippu. It is very close proximity to where the church feast takes place. Okay? So... This is the reason as to why I think people who are knowledgeable of the park will are making this request. It's a place which is known for the western part of the park, Pomparipu, Periyavillu, Mailavillu. These are the areas where elephants are seen in large numbers. After the rains with the, the shooting of uh, fresh grass, you'd see large herds. I've counted about 70 to 80 elephants at Pomparipu in one go, including these tuskers when you see those of us who are interested in wildlife will understand that for tuskers of this nature to be, obviously there has to be large herds and herds of elephants. This is the Galge Vihara tusker, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, this guy killed by a poacher from Eluan Kulama. And thankfully, I was told by the Eluan Kulama office that the, the poacher committed suicide by shooting himself after some time. The truth or falsity of it, I'm not able to vouch, but that is what they said with a lot of confidence. And they were not, the, the poacher was not able to take the, 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 the tusks. The Mahavava tusker, which is a, quite a perally elephant, ladies and gentlemen, charges at everything that moves. In Mahavava area, you find this guy. Then, of course, the Pom Pomparippu single tux, tusker, a menacing elephant, but a beautiful specimen. And also, ladies and gentlemen, this is the month of June, right? The month of brides. And this is the time that Vilpattu puts out sweet treats. This is Veera, which is in season. This is Palu, in season. And when you have this kind of profusion of sweetness, ladies and gentlemen, something interesting takes place in Vilpattu. You guys are very happy <clears throat> on Friday evenings and so on to hit the bar, right? And have a booze. So... If you happen to go to Vilpattu in June, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to be in for a great treat. Because June's the time the teddy bears in Vilpattu have their picnic. Right? They hit the bar. Why do I say about the bar? What is in with the bar and the bears? Ladies and gentlemen, palu is a fruit that is quite sweet. And these guys, the bears, gorge themselves on these ripe berries that fall beneath the trees or they climb the trees and eat them. And after a while, these fruits start fermenting inside their bellies. 
that gives them a nice high right then what happens then what happens is what happens to all of us on friday nights and saturday nights okay so look at it like this the bears get this chance only once a year and they put to fall ladies and gentlemen <laughs> right and in the night they would have that they have this fun they'll go back into the jungle and if you're lucky enough you will see a few of them still hanging around the roads in vilpattu right they look at you as if like where the hell have you descended that kind of sort of look you know that this guy is you know a bit tipsy now i'm sure you you enjoy this images you keep wow you know is image close images and so on and so forth and you probably wonder what on earth am i showing with image like this right i know there are many great photographers in this audience ladies and gentlemen is slot bear that chico marit photographed at maradam madu in vilpattu let's read his note taken at vilpattu on a push cycle and a box camera <laughs> so those of us who go around vilpattu ladies and gentlemen in the comfort of our land rovers and land cruisers and photograph with 800 and 600 lenses 1dxs what have you i'm sure now you have a little bit more respect for chico marit imagine going on a push cycle and a, taking a photograph of bears <laughs> with a box camera that's how it used to be and that's that's the kind of dedication that has left to us things like vilpattu this is a golden palm civet ladies and gentlemen an animal which is not very commonly seen It belongs to a genus called paradoxerus uh, there are three species that have been described this is the one that is found in vilpattu this guy was blind and that's why during the day he was walking around at talavila and i managed to get a photograph is another animal that you hardly see when you go for your park round this is called the pygmy pipistrel as uh, imposing at its as it looks it's about the size of about 3 inches one smallest mammal uh, smallest bat species that you find in this country you find also the snider's leaf nose bat or the bat they call hipposiderus spioris the the large i mean the 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 the, the, the commonest species of bat maradam madu and so on you see you also have in vilpattu ladies and gentlemen the northern purple face leaf monkey you know there are four races of the the purple face leaf monkey the western race the beyond kaluganga race the bear monkey and then of course the semnopithecus semnopithecus vetellus filbricki or the northern race and these guys can be seen at uh, the pomparippu uttamadaru bridge as well as close to uh, maradam madu and so on It's also a place for birds. You find the yellow wagtail. There are four races that visit the country, ladies and gentlemen. This is called Motacilla flava thunbergi. You have Feldeg bima and lutea. I have seen Feldeg also at uh, Kaliwillu, but I have not been able to photograph. And I'll show you something a little bit interesting as well. Mm, you might be wondering what is so special about this photograph. look at its feet you see that it's approaching its nest these are the two eggs check out its breast you can't uh, just remember the the how the feather formation and see what happens when the bird perches down to sits down to incubate okay so that's little things that mother nature has provided uh Now, if you go in a jeep, and if you're alerting the jeep driver to young, 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 you will not see these. I stayed for about four hours, ladies and gentlemen, to get this sequence. Where I, I've read about this in Henry, I've read about this uh, in, in the bird guides, but I've never observed this. It's a very wary bird. So when I saw this guy nesting at uh, by the side of the main road at Borupan Villa, I thought, okay, fine, to hell with the leopards, hell with the bear. I'm going to do this. and uh, i was quite pleased with the with the images that i got i'm also asked ladies and gentlemen on on occasions please don't judge me my photography on this this is for a purpose this is a male ceylon paradise flycatcher you remember the fact that th this has a very very pronounced necklace here the way in which you differentiate between the male and the female is not by the length of its tail but by you can see that there is no necklace that you can find demarcated black line this is the female because the males ladies and gentlemen when they molt they go through a period where they would have short tails as well 
So that is how you differentiate. This is in Vilpattu at Hunu Vilagama, the Ceylon Paradise fly, fly catcher. This is the resident race. Then of course you have the Indian race. And to add to the complication, the, the, the females of this guy resembles the Sri Lankan uh, female. Okay, it's the same species but two color morphs that are found. At Pallekanda, ladies and gentlemen, is a black winged kite. It was hunting uh, mice. Mm, it took a bit of time, as you would, as you can imagine, uh, to, to, to observe because it was always, when if you have obse observe this bird, the black winged kite, they always look down. They're looking down for their prey. Uh, and then you had to wait till the moment where it raises its head, where you could get the glistening part of its red eye to have an image which will be of value. Lovers of manna, this is a bird you all are quite uh, sort of happily uh, photographed. This is uh, the Rufus Ram Shrike. You get them in Vilpattu as well towards Marichakaddi. And the large Kuku Shrike, also a bird which is tough to get. In the outskirts of the national park, this was at uh, Radhagama, uh, you are able to again have images of these guys as well. Then the reptiles, ladies and gentlemen, Milpatu is not only about mammals and birds, these are the kind of uh, reptiles that I have been able to record. And I'll show you something which is special. This is called Nessia Hikanala. I'm extremely thankful to Mendis Vikramasinghe, the gentleman who delivered the, the WNPS lecture before me, the person with whom I have done uh, field studies on herpetology, for giving me this image. This is uh, a skink, a legless skink, and Vilpattu is the only locality, so it's an endemic to Vilpattu National Park. Then you also have Rhinophis dorsimaculatus. These are shield tails, the burrowing snakes that are found in Sri Lanka. This guy was first described by Daraniel from Marichakaddi. And now you know, Mendis and them found it at uh, Viditalathiu and uh, correctly uh, described as Rhinophis dorsimaculatus. Uh, earlier there were misidentifications that it is Rhinophis zigzag, but this is the species that is found. All the more important, ladies and gentlemen, that places like Marichakaddi, uh, Forest Reserve, Vilattakulam, and so on and so forth, which have got gazetted in the recent past, are protected. Then you have other snakes, which are difficult to see in Vilpattu, even though it's a common species. These at uh, uh, Manikapalautu, ladies and gentlemen, for some reason, the cobra is a male cobra, was disturbed, and I managed to get some images. But the same cannot be said about many uh, types of snakes. Most of the time, uh, in order to photograph, if they are found outside, the, outside uh, in areas, outside forests and so on, uh, you would have to handle them. Otherwise, it's actually difficult to remove them from places where they are found. Like in the case of this common crate, this is, a, this is a guy that I found uh, in the garden of where, in the place that I stay. Many of, some of you might know, I stay at a place called, I stay at many places, but the closest place to the park is called Dulos Mahe guest, guest. And one day in the night when I was sleeping, they called and said, there's a snake in the garden, sir. And I went and I realized that it's a common Indian crate. These are deadly venomous species. So obviously if I left it, it would have, you know, you know what it would have happened. So I uh, removed it and I released it inside the park down Ikirigolava Road. Same with this hump-nosed viper, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, actually, if you know how to handle them, snakes are, snakes are not dangerous animals. I handle my life, my, I handle my wife every day, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> and it's far more difficult, far more unpredictable than, of course, these poor old snakes. So don't, 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 talk, don't look at them as if that they are some evil creatures, they are not so. They also have to share this earth with us and that is why they are put there. They serve a very, very important ecological purpose in our ecosystems. Vilpatu is also a place where, ladies and gentlemen, five species of agamid lizards are found. This is the fan-throated lizard, Sitana bahiri. It was split from the southern dry zone species uh, in the recent past. We have the painted lip lizard, an endemic lizard. The reason why it's called painted is this guy on the same tree would change its color to, to red, okay? This is not, by the way, this is not putting its any lipstick. This is a male that is trying to attract a female. 
when it comes to animals ladies and gentlemen the men are the ones which look gorgeous unlike in humans so they always have to put on a big show like the peacock in order to attract the females and it's the females that get to choose then you also have the 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 the, the uh, chameleon uh, the, the only species of chameleon that is found in sri lanka again i'm thankful to mendes for arranging i mean facilitating for me to take this image this was at eluan kulama the gecko that you see when you go into the national park bungalows ladies and gentlemen is called the bark gecko lesion uh, hemidactylus lesionalty i caught this guy uh, from a from a vera tree outside and you can see that the it's 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 uh, exterior resembles that 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 of a of a of a vera tree because of the fact that i knew that it's going to change its color and within minutes see the color it took you, it's hardly visible you can see him on the same same exterior then ladies and gentlemen i was very keen to find out about the existence of salt water crocodiles in vilpattu because gangewadi area uh, dinal samarsinga who is in the audience today and often uh, uh, conjectured and we have discussed look there is a possibility of them being there even though they are not there are no records of the guy so uh, a few days ladies and gentlemen myself dinal and uh, dr erik pikamanaika we conducted a, a, a survey of the gangewadi and the kalaveva area which is known which is looked to pre preferred habitat for salt water crocodiles we came across a few uh, crocodiles about seven of them uh, dinal is, is the expert dinal conducts the study at nilwala so we looked at them we were camped at kalave we looked at these guys ladies and gentlemen but nevertheless the salt water crocodile or crocodilus porosus was not found uh, something that actually dinal explained to me these protrusions that are found on the neck of this crocodile this is called crocodilus palustris or the maga crocodile is not found so even though we call the salt water crocodile the gatta kimbula on its neck the absence of the gatta is what differentiates it from the the common mugger crocodile so we found a few some are, some were young some some were bigger bigger than that ladies and gentlemen but the salt water crocodile is not found so there's only one species of crocodile that is found at vilpattu then something about butterflies the autumn leaf this species is always found between nelum villa and panikka villa that's the area if you're interested in butterflies where you can see the autumn leaf then the blue wanderer animal that then the painted lady the britishers gave them wonderful names ladies and gentlemen so therefore they have pretty names unlike uh, some of the other species like the reptiles where we describe now and go with scientific names so painted lady is usually known from the mid hills and the upper hills and so on uh, this is quite uh, extreme north for it even woodhouse states that it is very rare towards the north so this is at Ka just below kajuwatta in vilachya area that i managed to get this guy plain which is also an uncommon butterfly that i found in vilpattu the long banded silver line uh, silver lines are pretty beautiful striking butterflies ladies and gentlemen mm, if you have the the patience like mr arita vikramanayaka had the time that he published his wonderful masterpiece of a book you would know the type of uh, effort that you have to go through to try and photograph these guys because you need to photograph them Uh, in you know in order to be able to understand the and uh, and identify them the red spot duke ladies and gentlemen is is a butterfly that is again found in vilpattu there's a species of tree called pulima in vilpattu during the fruiting season these butterflies get attracted to the fruits like the bears they get intoxicated after gorging themselves on the sap of this fruit and then they just lie around otherwise they are pretty skittish animals polon narua shrub frog or pseudophilota pseudophilotus regius is a species that is found it, it it's a frog that calls out to, uh, to, towards uh, dusk but very difficult to see because of its retiring habits so night photography surrounding the park is is something that one has to engage if you're interested in seeing these guys as well as the uh, sri lanka bullfrog or colula taprobanica also ladies and gentlemen Believe it or not, this humble little crab 
freshwater crab. There are 52 of them in found in Sri Lanka, 51 of them are endemic to the country. So says Mohammed Bahir, who is the expert on this subject. I'm thankful to him for actually identifying this guy. This guy's name, actually there's no common name, this guy's name is Oziothelfusa Hippocastano, right? I'm sure you would agree, being from that old school, Ananda College, my colors being maroon and gold, I thought I will name it, I looked at it and I thought, let me give, this is for the public at large, so I gave it a name, maroon and gold paddy field crab. This is another species, there are two species of scorpions that I found in Vilpattu. There are 18 species of scorpions found in the world, ladies and gentlemen, in 2015. There was a scorpiology study that was conducted by Professor Kitsiri Ranavana and his team. They added four new species. They belong to a family called Buthidae. This is the guy which is called Heterometrus swamidermi. This is considered the largest uh, uh, scorpion species in the world. It's about nine inches in length. Quite an interesting character. Don't get dissuaded to going to Vilpattu, but at Eluankulama, we were at a, we were at a place, actually, uh, Dinal, myself, and Dr. Eric. We went to this guest house, Eco Lodge, and true to its word, when you opened the door on the wall was this guy. So it was Eco, all right. Um, but what is interesting, the point that I want to make, ladies and gentlemen, is that of the 18 species of scorpions that we find in Sri Lanka, there's one species called Hotentota tamulus or the Indian red scorpion, which is deadly venomous. Okay? This guy was not found in Sri Lanka until the time of the war. So it is believed that he was introduced from India with the IPKF. So those of us who are bird watching, uh, bird photographers who would lie flat on the ground to take that ground level shot, you got to be a bit careful. If you are in, in, in the Jaffna Peninsula, that's the only area where these animals, this animal have been found. Gentleman by the name of Dr. Karuna Tilaka wrote a paper on this and the and the uh, and the, and the protection and the sort of the, the treatment for this particular scorpion. Little bit about the wildflowers, ladies and gentlemen. 130 species of wildflowers I've been able to record so far. This is a species that is referred to as Indian Kadaba. In Singhala, it's called Iravara. Mm. Kadaba trifoliata this is a characteristic species, uh, a species which is found in Vilpattu because of these two petals. It's of uh, Ayurved medicinal importance used in Siddha and Ayurvedic medicine. These are the bimsavan or the purple flowers that you find around Villus. It's called, uh, do these, these are Dopatrium species, ladies and gentlemen, called the horsefly's eye. What you see here, this is Thalavilla. The species that you find right around this Vilpattu, uh, this uh, Villu, are these Dopatriums. Also, ladies and gentlemen, in Vilpattu you get a species of Nelu. Stenesiforium cordifolium is the scientific name. It's a species of Nelu, ladies and gentlemen. There are two species of dry zone Nelu that are found in the country. Like in Horton Plains, every periodically, after five years, these things bloomed. And then this is close to uh, Pillimote area but between Talavila and Pomparipu. And they bloom, bloom in profusion like this. The whole road, so to speak, on bushes gets covered with this Nelu. And it's actually, if you're into wildflowers, it's a breathtaking sight. Then you also have a species that is referred to as king of bitters. This is Bim Kohomba. I'm sure many of you would have heard of the medicinal values of Bim Kohomba. Pinronia manronia pinnata. This was found at Ochapukallu in blue. Hugonia mystax is another wildflower that again flowers in profusion just after the rains in Vilpatu. Vilpatu also has a number of species of orchids. I said there are nine species, ladies and gentlemen. This is Vanda tessellata, the pink variety, which is quite rare. Samantha Gunasegara tells me that it's almost ex ex extinct in the wild now. He's a guy who has studying for a PhD on, on Vanda Tessalata, Samantha Gunasekara, who provided yeoman service the time that he was Director General of the Biodiversity Unit in Sri Lanka Customs. You also have the, the Vanilla Volcari, which is a leafless orchid, which is in bloom these days. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, you, uh, the, the, the ground orchids, there are four species of ground orchid that are found in, in Vilpatu. This is something called Habenaria roxburghi or Roxburgh's orchid. Until 2005, 
it was believed that this orchid was endemic to india until uh, dr suranjan dr samantha suranjan and samantha gunasekar found it in nil in, in nilgala area and they were quite thrilled when i was able to discover this species in belpattu so on a positive note ladies and gentlemen the northern part whatever that is left of the settlements 100,030 acres i'm thankful to mr jagat gunawardena for giving me this correct information was gazetted under the forest department as mavillu conserved forest so all it not all is not lost ladies and gentlemen the effort that the wnps all all the all the conservationists and everybody who spoke about willpatu yielded in something positive as well now we need to ensure that we go forward and try and bring about a, a, a logical end to this will the illegal road i sincerely hope we'll be able to achieve that because it's worth that effort as well as of course the other challenges that the park faces so ladies and gentlemen i hope that i've been able to impress upon you the importance of preserving what we refer as vilpattu the villu pattu where it all began the advent of our race and the pre place of prehistoric importance and a place of sheer beauty for me more than anything else which gives me uh, which functions for me as a stress reliever from office an opportunity to try and do something which is meaningful without try and complaining about the bad things that are going on i often realize that when you always continue to say that you know this is happening that is happening you get you 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 you're very angry you're very unpleasant but that's one thing i mean there's nothing much that uh, you can control the entire of your external factors that take place but you can control ladies and gentlemen what you can do and this is what i have done while being a corporate personality so ask yourselves and think and please make a commitment that next time i'm not asking you to do websites and study of leopards and snakes and what have you but speak up don't be shy don't feel awkward speak up and say this is something that is worth preserving let us not permit the people the the, the people who sometimes don't even understand the importance of this kind of national treasure to disappear from us thank you very much ladies and gentlemen close to close to marichakaddi there is a tank called viadikulam that is between tekkama and marichakaddi that is the place that is a normal tank that they use for agriculture they pump the water from water from that particular tank but other than that they have ground wells that they that they make and uh, with that they they take water for their drinking couple of comments and uh, and a question first yes, thank you thank you thank you i mean we need more of such presentations and i think you can do this like in so many other places in schools really that was so inspirational um i think you are totally right we need as individuals to be much more activist um we we have a tendency to say ah the government is not doing this or it's the mistake of our politicians but i think as individuals we can do a lot more and we are all starting to realize that we can do a lot more now i have a question uh, yesterday there was an announcement that uh, the um, landfill project in um, avu kuvalu or arukuvalu i think arukalu yes yeah. arvakalu sorry about that uh, was uh, pretty much confirmed and um it used to be just in the buffer area of ilpatu i'm wondering if you have any update on um on the mitigation measures that are going to be taken um and whether or not this project is really going to go ahead because this is going to be or it, it is a threat to uh, ilpatu that's correct arawak kalu is a is a area just outside the uh, ilpatu where the uh, cement factory is operating and where they have uh, the excavations has gone on i think but the idea is to fill those things with uh, with with garbage but the concern of course is that then they can seep through to to the gangewadi area where the whole uh, ecosystem there will can get destroyed i'm not able to confirm ma'am as to whether the government has taken a decision in fact to do so but if in fact they have taken a decision like that it is it is of course sad because i think the the solution for garbage should be a incinerator 
and turning that, that into uh, fertilizer and so on, not to be paying good money uh, and transporting them hundreds of kilometers to another locality. So yes, there will be environmental damage if you, if you do what, what if, if, if they do, do that. And I sincerely hope that SENA Council will prevail and they will uh, find better solutions than that.